good. Talking mm -hmm. about myths and legends, I wanted to do something rather different today. I, I've, I've actually been up to um, the site of a battle, a battle site known as um, Eru Bedai. And it's one of those places that people say that there may have been a battle. Uh, there's no real evidence there, but the landscape looks quite fitting for a battle site. And with that backdrop today, I'd like to introduce um, four little stories. One's about Gellert. And there's another story here about Owen Llaugor, or Llewyn Owen Llaugor. Um, and then I'm going to look at, look at the, um, the meaning behind the name San Helen, or San Ellen, which I'm sure a couple of you would be rather interested in. The other one I want to look at today is the physis physicians of um, Medvai. Um, and all of these have got a little bit of a fact associated with them. And we can't do myths, legends, looking for facts without looking at something to do with King Arthur. And we may talk about a few other things as well. And we've got Gellert. Now, as Bill mentioned earlier on, this is the locality of Gellert's grave. And whether you want to feel that the legend is fact or fiction, I think when we look at the consciousness of our land, lots of the stories associated with our makeup could be said to be based on something. Now, to start off with, when we look at the grave of Gellert, the trusty dog of Llewellyn the Great, Llewellyn Apioroth, we know one thing about the story. We know that Llewellyn existed. So, where there's a myth or a legend, there's a fact waiting to be told. So look at this, Gellert. A short walk south of the village of Bev Gellert, following the footpath along the banks of the Glasleen River, leads to Bev Gellert's um, most famous historical feature, Gellert's grave. And I looked at a number of different versions associated with this. And then I came to the question, is this story based on fact or fiction? The answer is, there are some facts here, but the dog might actually be fiction. But I am reminded of something that I've mentioned to you many, many times before. We have a wonderful land here and what historians and archaeologists do is that we deconstruct the myths and legends and sometimes that leaves us with very little in the sense of national pride. We do it very very well in Cymru. Earlier on I was listening to a program on the radio after I'd got back from my little expedition to Eru Bevai, the battle site. Eru Bevai basically means the acre of graves, which I've actually made a little video about today. And this historian, Brian Davis, he said, what we need to do is we need to leave some of those myths and legends intact. So back to what I was saying, I was listening to the radio earlier on, and it was talking about um, Aboriginal myths, legends, facts, and fiction. And as I was listening to it, um, they were saying things like, um, in, our, in our dream space, in our land of dreams, um, uh, you know, people came from the heavens and taught us, taught us things, and then they disappeared. And I thought, yeah, I believe that. And I actually did, because it's their culture. And that's the point. When you've got a culture, you've got to uh, believe everything that that culture brings with it. And even what, if you believe in King Arthur or not, you've got to chuck, chuck him into the mix. The story of Gellert, as written on the tombstone, reads, In the 12th 
hundreds, Llewellyn, Prince of North Wales, at a palace of Bed Gellert. One day he went hunting without Gellert, the faithful hound who was unaccountably absent. On Llewellyn's return, the hound, stained and smeared with blood, joyfully sprang to meet his master. The prince, alarmed, hastened to find his son and saw the infant's cot empty, the bed clothes and floor covered with blood. And th this is the downside of the story. The frantic father, Llewellyn the Great, plunged his sword into the hound's side, thinking it had killed his heir. The dog's dying yell was answered by a child's cry. Llewellyn searched and discovered his boy unharmed, but nearby lay the body of a mighty wolf which Gellert had slain. The prince filled with remorse is said never to have smiled again. He buried Gellert here. Now, before we go on to the next bit, which denies that this is actually based on anything, I would like to tell you a little bit of a story, a little bit of a confession, actually. Um, when, when, um, when we planned our first um, Myths and Legends walk um, at Monk Nash, I was looking around to find stories, not about the history and archaeology, about about ghosts and stuff. So I I went with somebody to a, a site along the route, Monk Nash going to the sea. And I said, look, I'm going to make up a ghost story. And we tried to make up a ghost story, but it didn't work. It just didn't fit. So I said, I said, why don't we do this? And it just didn't work. Okay, what if I, what if I sort of try and believe in the story it just didn't work and then i then i told the story to michelle and she said you made that up didn't you and i said yeah do you think anybody else will and 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 then you start to realize that you, you it's really difficult to make up a really plausible story so it failed as an exercise but it did it actually no it actually succeeded as an exercise because i then then when we look at this story now it sort of completely denies that the story of um, Beth Gellert is based on anything. So Church of St. Mary at Beth Gellert and this is that little snippet that completely disowns the story. Sadly the legend of Gellert is not actually true. Well before I go any, before I go any further does that story sound as, sound as if it's got some kind of trueness to you Gillian? Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm with yes. Yeah, definitely. Because yeah, it, it sounds, it doesn't sound too good to be true. It sounds true. And that, that's, um, it, 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 you know, um, go on. It might have been embellished a little, but I, it, yeah, it could be true. And I've always believed it. Because th this is what Brian Davis said. He said, when you've got these myths and legends, um, you've got to believe in them. And, 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 and you've got to believe in them, that's it. Although Llewellyn was a real prince born in 1173, died in 1240, the dog part was a fanciful addition and a masterstroke of marketing. The story was originally collected to the village by a shrewd businessman. David Pritchard moved to Beth Gellert from South Wales and was probably already familiar with the tale of a man consumed by remorse for mistakenly killing his faithful dog. In fact, this story, the legend exists in several cultures and may have its roots in Asia. The name of the village was probably originally Beth Kellet and is thought to refer to the grave of an Irish saint or early Peter Celtic warrior. But the fact of the matter is, it sounds like a really good story and for one, we're halfway there, Gillian, because we've got, you know, Llewellyn existed. We're also further there because um, Llewellyn had hounds, 
you know, all big. So we're also part way there. We're also there because Llewellyn actually had um, children, um, male heirs. So, you know, all we need to do is change it a little bit and we've more, more or less got the story. So why can't it be, why can't it be a real story? So the next one I want to go on to is this. It's not ringing any bells yet, is it? This and this and this. No, no it's not ringing any bells at all. Um, now, this is a rather interesting one, um, and it's a shame Dell's not joined us tonight. Um, a few, um, a few, I think it must be months ago now, right? I was going to look at the story of um, Owen Claugorch. Yeah. Um, and Owen Claugorch is, is one of those princes after, after um, Llewellyn and before Owen Glyndwr, right? Owen Claugorth, W, uh, start again, Owen Claugorth, L A W G O C H, um, basically Owen the Red. You know, this, this is a figure. Now, he did exist. Now, I'm going to read out, it sounds like a fairy story, but um, when you actually get to the end of the story, you start to think, hmm, there might be something in that. So, the, the place that it takes place is actually a place known as Craig Adinus, a Dinis rock. That's basically what Craig Adinus means, Dinis rock. So it, it's, um, it's basically um, heading um, all the way up to um, Merthyr Tidville. It's south of Ustrid Vachta. Um, it's north of Chiorki, so I could probably get there in about 40 minutes. Right. So what I'd like to do is introduce this figure. And interestingly enough, Owen Claugorth did, did exist. He was, he was a massive figure in history. But sometimes to remember figures in history, you've got to embellish them. Probably what you just said about um, the dog, but it wasn't meant that way. But in this way, um, to try and make sense of Owen Claugorch, let's read this little bit of a fairy story. On top of Craig Adinus, is an old gnarled hazel tree. But when you look closer, the tree vanishes. And this is what we're talking about. Is it that tree? Mm. A shepherd lay, um, lay nearby and was weary of life. He was aware of this vanishing tree. So you look at it and then it disappears. So he decided to leave and seek his fortune. So a weary lad laying down, weary of life, he wants to go and find his fortune. Type of dream, lying in bed one day, I gotta go and find my fortune. He wrapped his few belongings in a red spotted handkerchief, cut a hazel stick from the tree at Craig Adinus, which is this tree here. This hazel tree, this old gnarled hazel tree, is it the one on top now? And set off along the old Welsh tramping road, which will link us into the next bit when we do San Helen. So there you go. A stranger joined him and said, that's a fine stick. Where did you cut it from? The lad explained and the stranger's eyes shone. If you take me to that tree, we will both find our fortunes. The lad's eyes lit up. So the stranger followed the lad to the old gnarled hazel tree on the top of Craig Adinus. Now again, it's an old gnarled hazel tree, but when you look closer, the tree vanishes. So there you go. So it's on the top of Craig Adinus. There it is. So the stranger handed the lad a shovel and told him to dig. It's quite an unusual, unusual thing to do. Soon he heard the clang of spade on stone. Well, obviously it's a rock. Sorry. He lifted the stone and saw a flight of steps. Now this is where it gets interesting. The stranger gave him a candle and told him, climb down the steps and you will come to a vaulted corridor with a rope leading along the wall. 
Take hold of the rope and follow it to a cave where you will find gold. But be careful to hold the rope gently as it is attached to a bell, which will wake the armed warriors who are guarding the gold. Can I stop there? If this, if this legend sounds familiar, you will be right. Because there's a similar legend associated with southeast of South Wales, um, along the Vale of Morgan coast, associated with, with Merlin and Arthur, are not Owen Tlaugoch. The lad only heard the word gold, as you do. He, mm -hmm. After all, he was weary of life. He went to find his fortune. There you go. And not the words of the armed warriors. He climbed down the steps, gently took hold of the rope, followed it along the corridor, and found himself in a dark cavern dripping with stagnant water. A great old oak table stood in the middle with warriors seated all around, swords and shields by their sides, heads resting on their arms, resting on the table, all snoring with a smell of sweet, uh, start again, with a smell, a smell of sweat in the air. Sweaty lads. On the table was a pile of gold coins printed with the image of the French king. What French king may you add? And next to them a bell. At the end of the table sat, bolt upright, was a huge man with red plaited hair and a red birthmark on his right hand. This was Owen Claugorch. Listening for the ringing of the bell to waken him to lead his country to freedom. Now, I'm sure most of us have never heard of Owen Claugorch but he did exist. The lad filled his pockets with more coins than he needed, so many that he brushed against the bell and there was a clang. The warriors awoke, shook themselves free of sleep and dust, drew their rusty iron swords and surrounded the lad. Clau Gorch's great red hand reached out and grabbed the lad and he boomed. Is it the day? Ar adin hin div. Is it the day? The lad, with commendable calmness, said, No, go back to sleep. The warrior sat down. Klaugorf closed his eyes, and the lad returned to the stranger and emptied his pockets. There was more money than either of them could ever wish for. So the stranger suggested they split what they had and go their ways, or the lad could go back to the cave and bring more gold. Such is the greed of man, the lad needed no persuasion. But when he climbed down the steps, there was no rope, no corridor, no cave, no bell, no warriors. He climbed back up the steps, but the stranger had, had vanished along with all the gold. He looked around and the gnarled old tree disappeared also before his eyes. He stood on a bare hillside with a few sheep laughing at him, which is quite strange. Sheep and, laugh? Yeah, the sheep <laughs> laughing at him, you know. Yeah, this, I, I, I didn't notice that when I read it earlier on. He stood on a bare hillside with a few sheep laughing at him. Um, now, the interesting thing about Owen Claugorch is not only is he associated with this legend, there's his coat of arms and there's Owen Claugorch. And if you notice, those, those look very familiar. Royal family. Anyway, Owen Claugorch, Owen of the Red Hand, was Owen at Thomas ap Rodri, the great nephew of the last true born Prince of Wales, Llewellyn ap Gruffydd. He was born in Tarfield, Surrey, but fled to France, where he was known as um, Yevin de Gales, Owen of Wales. To the Welsh, he was a heroic rebel who would return to free his land from occupation. 
To the English, he was a murderous outlaw who skulked in caves after his lands had been confiscated. In 1372, Owen led a fleet of ships towards Wales, but only reached as far as Guernsey. Seven years later, he had become such a nuisance, he was assassinated and buried at saint Laguerre um, in France, where he awaits the ringing of the bell. And you know what? I bet you've never heard of that invasion that, that didn't actually get as far as the Welsh coastline. No, never. No, exactly. Now, there is something else about this figure. Is he, he, was, a, he was a very major crusader. Um, and Where's the statue, Carl? Oh, the statue itself. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I do actually believe... I'm going to take... Actually, um, I'm guessing that that is actually... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that that is either in North Wales or that is actually by Craig Dinnis. But um, I may find that one out and tell you tomorrow, okay? Mm -hmm. It'd be a nice statue, actually. Statue, I will do the research on that one. But you know, do you know there's one weird little story here which I wasn't going to do? Did you know there's a legend associated with Aberystwyth? Everyone knows that Hitler was in college in Aberystwyth. He liked, the old, he liked the old town so much that he gave special orders that London, um, that though London be raised, Aberystwyth must be saved. And do you know what? I've looked that one up. And unfortunately, um, there's no evidence that Hitler ever came to Wales, let alone um, attending Aberystwyth College. But you know, these things can bandy around. Um, and it's, it's, it's said that there is one historian in Aberystwyth that claims point blank that Adolf Hitler did actually go to Aberystwyth College. Very strange, sorry. <laughs> but you, know, you can't make that one up, you can't. But the thing is, the thing is, it's very difficult to make up plausible things like that. In black and white, it's there, right? It's, it's really, really odd that one. Now, I, I, um, I, I, I was thinking, right, so what we've done, Owen Cloudgoff existed, we know he existed, but there is one, um, and, and we've I've mentioned Gellert, so yeah, I, I, I believe that the Gellert story is true, and the yeah. Owen Cloudgoff bit, well, you know, we do feel he's going to return someday, do you know what I mean? Yeah? So, go on. Some of it may be, but not the rest, I don't believe. Oh, what, the cave and the bell? Yeah, okay, fair enough. <laughs> but the same story is said about um, King Arthur. Um, it's, it's said that King Arthur will one day um, come back to our coast and will lead us um, against all those invaders and push them back towards the sea. Um, that, that's, that's what some of these great legends tell us. So... The one, I, the one I want to look at next is um, associated with, with a name. Um, and it, it's in black and white there. The, the name San Helen. Now, San Helen um, is a name for not just one, not just two, but several roads or routeways in Wales. Um, San Helen refers to several stretches of Roman roads in Wales, one in, definitely in the north and one definitely in the south, but there are one or two others. Anything that's remotely Roman in Wales is referred to as a San Helen. Uh, the 160 mile route, uh, which follows a meandering course through central Wales, connects Aberconway in the north with Carmarthen in the west. Despite its length, academic debate continues as to the precise course of the Roman road and whether it is really, really exists. Uh, many sections are now used by the modern road network. So to try and find whether it really, really existed is not gonna be possible now. Uh, while other parts are still traceable. However, there are sizable stretches that have been lost and are unidentifiable. I tell you a weird little story. I, um, I, I, I was armed with a map this one day and I took about, I took about seven, no, I took about seven people. I was going to say 76 people. I took seven people. I don't, yeah, it was seven. Um, and I said, look, we've got this map. And it says, 
this is the route of the San Helen. And I think we went somewhere near Breckenway. Like this was what this was the other San Helen or one of the San Helens. See, I'm just confusing the matter now, right? But anyway, um, it, we saw it on the map. It said San Helen. So I took them up on this mountain and we kept following nothing. And we kept following absolutely nothing. And we come to a little gateway and I, um, a little stone wall and there was a little gap. And I said, that's the San Helen. Everyone's going, but, and I'm saying it's, in, it's on the map here. It's definitely on the map, right? So the, the biggest problem with, with lots of roads, um, Roman roads in, in Wales is that um, we don't really know where they were. Uh, we, we do know um, that a few years ago when they were digging up the road, going to the sea from Carmarthen through to Whitland, they actually found, they found an identifiable bit of Roman road, which was great. Uh, but when you, find, when you find bits of Roman roads, they're not what you think they are. Um, what, what they are is, um, is, is, a, is a hollow, right? So you've got soil pushed on either side and it's just a hollow. Um, and any Roman road surface is gone because what's happened is, is um, the road would be up and then as erosion causes, stuff gets moved to the side and then it forms a hollow. So you don't have any original Roman road surface. So you can't really prove whether it's a Roman road or not. Now, this next bit here is something that I've got written in front of me. Um, so the one, the one from the north to Carmarthen, there you go. The route is named after St. Ellen of Carnarvon. Um, you go, Pete, just to wind you up, a native British saint um, whose story is told in the dream of Maxen Waledig. Now, that's really interesting because um, this is referring to Magnus Maximus. Um, Emperor Magnus Maximus, a really interesting figure. And, and um, the dream of Maxen uh, Waledig, or Waledig um, is, is in the Mabinogion. Now, one of the things about the Mabinogion, the Mabinogion is full of loads of different stories about this princess, this king, this, and dreams and all the rest of it. Um, and the, the Mabinogion is, is a wonderful story um, of, of, of a whole collection of different stories associated with Cymru. Um, however, um, Magnus Maximus did exist and the Romans did build roads. And look at this last bit. She is said to have ordered the construction of roads in Wales during the late 300s associated with Magnus Maximus. That's an interesting thing. Another interesting point is, is that um, Maxim Oledig is meant to have been a native Welshman who marched on Rome um, to seize um, the imperial purple to become the Roman emperor. And whether you want to believe King Arthur or not, King Arthur is, is thought to be stylized on Magnus Maximus, okay? Um, or Maxim Oledig. The other thing as well is this is not to be confused with um, with the character in the film um, Gladiator, when you've got Maximus. But there was actually a Maximus as a general associated with Marcus Aurelius. So you've got all these different things coming into it. And it gets really complicated when you're, when you're trying to understand all these different areas of history. And again, Gillian, just mm -hmm. absorb the stories. Absorb this one and see what you think, okay? Okay. Maxim Oledig, the Emperor Maximus, was hunting in the woods near Rome when he felt drowsy. He ordered his men to raise their shields to protect him from the sun. He lay down and began to dream. He was following a river over mountains as high as the sky across a level plain towards a walled city by the sea. He walked over a bridge of whalebone onto a fleet of ships and sailed to an island where he entered a golden roof castle at the mouth of a wide river. He walked past two auburn-haired lads dressed in black brocade who were playing 
Gurd Boch on a silver board with pieces of red gold. And a grey haired man sat in a chair made from elephant ivory who was carving Gurbush pieces. Next to him in a chair of red gold was a maiden in a white silk dress held at the shoulders with golden pins. She stood up, embraced him, and as their cheeks touched, the dogs pulled on their leashes. Shields clashed, spears touched, and Maximus awoke. So this figure is undoubtedly um, Helen. Now, it doesn't tell you, because I've already told you, that Magnus Maximus um, originated in Wales. And at that point of that legend, he is in Rome and he's now the emperor. So all that part of the story has been missed out. But we'll come on to that a little bit more. So this is, um, this is a length of road um, believed to have been part of the San Helena North associated with Beta Sequoid, which is, there it is. Um, so we're talking about going all the way from Abercon Way, following this down, and then you keep going down towards the south. And that is a coin of Magnus Maximus. All the emperor could think about was the maiden in the white dress. For three years, he sent messengers to search for her. Then the gypsy king told him to stand in the forest where he was dreaming and he would know which way to go. This is in the Mabinogion. This is. He realized he had traveled west. So he sent 13 messengers who followed rivers and marched over mountains until they came to the Isle of Britain. Onto the mountains of, of uh, the Isle of Mon, Anglesey, the land of Arvon, where they saw a castle at the mouth of the wide river. Two boys were playing Gorburg. A grey-haired um, man was carving pieces from gold and there was a maiden dressed in robes of white silk. They informed her that their emperor had met her in a dream and wished her to be empress of Rome. She told them that if the emperor was truly in love, he should leave his dream world and come and, uh, and, come and tell her in person. The emperor set off with a great army, took the island of Brithon, Britain, by force and drove the people into the sea. He came to the castle of Arvon, took the maiden and found she was a virgin. So he offered her a maiden's fee. She asked for the island of Britain for her father, old Odolf, and three forts for herself, Carnarvon, Caerleon, which is the thing we're going to come on to, Carverthin, Carnarvon, or Carmerthin, um, and she asked to be allowed to build roads between them, for she enjoyed travelling. Maximus agreed, and she set to work straightening and metling the old tracks and the great road south from Avon was named after her son, Helen. So, like lots of stories, these things are half backwards. Um, because in, in reality, um, Magnus Magnus and Magnus Maximus is marching from, from Wales and Britain and over to Rome. Um, and what about this story about this Ellen or Helen, Sam Helen? Ellen Hloydog was born, um, it's believed, to a Christian family um, and was daughter of Adolf Hen, uh, the old, the Roman ruler Octavius, which, which gets a bit strange, really, because that's hundreds of years earlier. She travelled with her husband and her five sons and accompanied them to Rome in 388. As she was walking along the San Ellen through Snowdonia, the favourite son was killed by an arrow fired by the giant Kudun. She wailed, Cross Aur, and the village that grew there became known as Cross Aur in memory of her grief. She became known as Saint Helen of Carnarvon, protectors of travellers and road builders. 
So if we want to re if we want to relook at that dream, if we want to relook at the Mabinogion, and if we think, well, what the hell's going on there? The story is about um, Ellen um, and Magnus Maximus marching onto Rome, um, and it might be um, as a piece of information that those roads are being rebuilt across our land, named after this Ellen or Helen, San Helen, um, between the forts of Carnarvon, Caleon, and Kyverdin, Carnarvon, which did exist. Um, and there may actually be a little bit of credence in those stories, but we can't say anything more than that. But these, these San Helens are very, very strange things, very strange things indeed. So there's one of his coins, and there he is looking very proud, Magnus Maximus. And again, the last story that we will come on to is in connection with, with Arthur. Um, and this is where we're going to go next. So we'll just quickly re recap on that. That's one of the San Helens, North Wales. Uh, so there'd be a San Helen from um, Carnarvon. Um, Carnarvon going all the way to uh, Carnarvon, um, Sagontium, um, which is Carnarvon. Um, you've got um, uh, Carverthin, um, which is going to be Carnarvon, and then you've got uh, Caleon, Isca, which is in Gwent. So you've got the other San Helen, and there's one or two other San Helens as well. So what I'd like to next go on to is a weird little story. Now, have you ever come across this one? Um, Langorse Cranog, Gillian. I know Langorse Lake, but I don't know the story, or I don't think I know it, but go you know, on. You know what I should do? Oh, we what? will be doing Killian. Um, there, there's, there's our Langorse Cranog there. That, that's where we are. And that's how big the lake is. Do you know what? I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you the story straight out of my head. Like, um, about 1991, I had a letter off um, Dr. Mark Rednop Knapp in the National Museum of Wales. And he said, would you like to accompany me to, um, to see the excavations at um, Langorse Cranog? His excavations. And amazingly enough, uh, Gillian, I didn't have enough confidence. I wasn't, didn't really go anywhere back then. And um, I didn't actually go and see these excavations. And I really wish I had, to be honest with you. Anyway, um, one thing about these excavations um, is that they, they excavated um, a cranog that is associated with a story that I've got in this book. Um, the story associated with the, the physicians of Medvai. Um, and it's, it's, uh, and Nangor's cranog, Lady in the Lake. And then you come back to King Arthur. So when, when, when they were excavating, what they found, they found a little cranog, um, and there it is, um, a little cranog um, off the coastline, and you, basically it's, um, it, it's, I should have actually shown you an image of it, but we'll, we'll, we'll do that again. Anyway, there's a little platform um, and a load of trees, and they started finding out that around those trees were all these early timbers from about the eight, nine hundreds, and there was all these bits of broken canoe and everything. So the Cranog itself was actually a settlement, a, a, a defended settlement by water in the middle of this lake. But it wasn't from the Bronze Age or the Iron Age. It was specifically from, you know, lots of these story that we talk about with the Mabinogion and, and so on and so on. Um, you know, that period of Arthur, it's all that, that sort of same thing. Um, and, you know, what they say about I don't believe in I don't believe in King Arthur at all. Um, but do you know what they say about um, uh, actual true believers in King Arthur? They actually deny the existence of King Arthur. So what does that make me, Gillian? Say that again, Carl. Basically, those who believe in King Arthur, right, deny yeah. that King Arthur ever existed. So I don't believe King Arthur ever existed. So you do believe in King Arthur? No, I don't believe he ever existed. No, I don't. I don't get this at all. <laughs> um, put it this way, right? As a scientific archaeologist, I'm prone to say that I don't believe in, in King Arthur. 
but there's enough evidence to say King Arthur existed in a number of different guises and forms. So, what, um, and you're too afraid to admit you believe in him? Oh, now, would I be afraid of anything? <laughs> it's, a yeah. it's a code, my dear. Is it? Yes, it uh, is. Well, I'm not, I'm not good at codes. <laughs> All right, then, here we go. Um, there's one thing about it. When, when Goff says, get on with it, he means it. Right, now, <laughs> now, 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 this, this, now I've got a book in front of me. I don't know if you're seeing this. It's, it, this is called Physicians of Medvi, right? Mm -hmm. Cures and Remedies of the Medieval World. Um, and you sort of read this, and then you end up at Langor's Cranog, and you think, oh, there must be something in this story. So I'm going to read it all out, right? It's going to take me a few minutes. And then we'll then come back to it. So the legend of the Lady of the Lake. Around um, 409 precisely, after nearly 400 years of occupation, on the 14th of October, the remaining Romans left Britain at 515. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, in the circular church la yard um, at St. Kine Llangain on the Clean Peninsula, which is a bloody mouthful, which is that bit of North Wales that goes out into the sea by Carnarvon. You know the one, right? Yeah. Uh, there is a monolithic pillar with the inscription of Nelai Medicae Philae Martini, uh, Martini Icit, the stone of Milos, the doctor of the son of Martinus. Now that's really interesting. Because this said the physicians of Medvi. So is Martinus, in fact, one of the physicians of Medvi? Anyway, carry on. This stone, which was also used as a sundial, um, represents the last evidence of medical care in Roman Britain. Nice. However, the tribes of Britain uh, had their own physicians and remedies. And the Christian Roman uh, British tribes carried on both British and Roman medical traditions. These were the early medieval period um, across Europe. Well, come on, we call it the Dark Ages, but I don't use that. It wasn't dark. Um, with barbarians overrunning Italy, the continent in England, um, and, um, and this is the Age of Saints here. And the Age of Saints in Cornwall, I forgot to mention that for Peter. Um, we in this wonderful land of ours in Cymru has the longest unbroken Christian heritage in the world. Despite attacks from the Irish, Danes, Norwegian, Scots and the Germanic tribes which overran England, Cymru resisted the pagans and remained independent until the murder of its last king, Llewellyn II in 1282. Not until the end of O England do us Cymru against the usurper Henry IV in 1415 was, uh, was Cymru completely conquered. Um, so that was the end of our dreams. During this time, our land had its own language, unique culture, the most humane laws in the world. Think of Hulbar. Um, and its own medical traditions. Princes, nobles and kings each had their own court um, medical men who also treated commoners. Treating commoners? Terrible. Many of the treatments were gathered in manuscripts over the centuries, but Wales was invaded upon dozens of occasions with the consequence of burning the scriptoriums, the libraries, the monasteries, the castles, the great houses, courts, cathedrals, and churches. So in other words, much of what we did have written down, Gillian, has gone. It's, it's been destroyed. Do you know, um, I'll tell you a little story about this as well. Raglan Castle had the biggest library in Wales. It was a massive library, right? Um, and unfortunately, Raglan Castle sided with the Royalists in the, um, in the Civil War. And when the Royalists captured Raglan Castle, they set light the library. And this is what we're talking about. You know, any books that may have survived were in Ragland and they were set like by the, by the parliamentarians. Terrible. So what, what we are left with is trying to make sense of like the Mabinogion, um, you know, the, the black books of, of Carmarthen, the, the land charters and all these different types of things to try and get an idea of what's going on. 
um, and Geoffrey of Monmouth in 1136. I've mentioned him because we're coming on to that. Little remained except for oral traditions and a very few surviving manuscripts. War across Wales did not end um, from the leavings of the Romans until the end of the Civil War. So we're constantly in a state of insurrection. It's a long time to be at war. Um, there is a paucity of written materials in this land. But what we do have is um, a manuscripts which are, which are called the manuscripts of um, Medvoi, which is great, the physicians of Medvoi. Three years after 1861, the edition of Medvoi God Medvoi um, appeared. Um, and this is, this, is, this is a rather interesting book. Where did it come from? His book illustrates Saxon practice alongside Medvoi's um, practice of medicine. So this is all about medicine. Um, when, when, we, when we go back to this, um, it, also, it also looks at um, tales of elves and dwarves. Um, but, as, and, but as nothing comparable with Madvoi's, the legend of the Lady of Clean Ivan Vach. Clean means lake and Ivan Vach means the small hill with Ban Hill and Bach being mutated to Fan and Vach. So what we're talking about is when we go back to the real stories of stories of Medvoi and any of the other things about elves and dwarves and stuff, um, the stories of Medvoi seem to be fixed in some fact rather than fiction. So what we're talking about there um, is wherever the Medvoi manuscripts come from after it's properly printed in edition, edition in 1861, it actually mentions about the legend of the Lady of the Lake, which if anybody knows anything about King Arthur, there you go. Um, so with, um, with this, with the story uh, that's associated with the Lady of the Lake, uh, written in the book of Medvoi, uh, is the following story. So we're gonna le read it out, so here we go. As proof of his love, the farmer offers her the bread and cheese he had brought for his midday meal. She tells him that his bread has been baked too long and is hard and that it is not easy to catch her. The farmer rushes home and consults with his man. The next day he comes with an offering of bread of which has not been baked enough and she rejects both him and the unbaked bread. Basically, uh, it's about a love. Um, love interest and if you think about the bread thing it, it takes us back to Alfred the Great as well where Alfred the Great uh, burns his bread anyway on his third attempt the bread is just right and she shares it with him so the lady of the lake in other words shares the bread with him then dives into the cold lake to tell her father that she wishes to marry so in other words um, on, we'll read that again. On his third attempt, the bread is just right, and she shares it with him. Then dives into the cold lake to tell her father that he wishes to marry. So in other words, uh, the bread is perfect. So she likes that. Seemingly, to test the father's affection, her father takes on one arm um, this daughter and on the other her identical sister. So in other words, um, takes two separate daughters out of the lake to test the love suitor. And the lady coming from the lake um, is so in love with this boy um, that she doesn't want any mistakes being made. So in other words, the man, the man of the lake with his two daughters has two identical looking daughters just to catch the boy out. He is unsure which one is his actual true love, but she pushes her little foot out gently and he recognizes her sandal, claiming her for his bride. So the father's impressed. The father gives her to the young farmer with the promise of as many sheep, goats, horses, and cattle as she can count without drawing breath. The only condition is that both the wife and dowry will be taken away if the farmer gives her three of causeless blows. In other words, if he hits her three times, everything's going to be taken away. 
right? The bridegroom agrees and his fiance calls a large herd of livestock from the lake by ingeniously counting in fives and they are married. So in other words, all these animals are coming from the lake. It's a bit like mm. the sword coming from the lake, you see? Sword coming mm. from the lake. All, pros all of this prospered. You know, everything went fine. Everything went perfectly fine. This is in the stories of the physicians and medwives. Everything went fine. And the couple have three handsome boys, Kadugan, Gruffith, and Ainyon, running a prosperous farm. However, there are three causeless blows. And suddenly, after the third, third blow on his wife, the wife returns to the lake with all the livestock, even taking a young black calf, which had just been slaughtered for veal. The dead calf returns to life, comes down from his hook and proceeds with the other cattle and livestock. The lady of the lake, however, then sometimes left her father and sisters to come to see her sons. She met them on a mountain side or in a wooded glade, but never entered their house or invited them to her own. Before a final leaving, um, before the final time she saw her sons, she left them a mysterious present, a bag which would console them for the loss of their mother and give them fortune and fame in the world. The bag contained medicine, and this was to be the medicine of the Mudvai. The th these would be the physicians of Mudvai. That, that itself is a wonderful story, but on another, on another note, it could actually have something about it. And there's another similar story. The story tells of a young man tending cattle upon the Black Mountains, which is known to have occurred from pre-Norman times. This is another story which, which is thought the story of Medvoi is based on. We know that the story is of pre-Norman origin from the archaic terms used for cattle. It is similar to other legends across Wales and Western Europe, and some believe that it may give reference to a royal cranog existing in the lake. So in other words, this, this story associated with the lady in the lake is actually associated with Langors Cranog and a real event that happened. And this is the only Cranog that we know about in the whole of Wales. So the story of Medvoi must be based on Langors Cranog. And why? The only Cranog uh, that we know of in Wales was destroyed in 916 after an invasion of the King of Mercia into the kingdom of Brycanyog. Taking the King of Brycanyog's wife and 43 prisoners from the Royal Cranog, which still exists on Langorse Lake in Bracknockshire today. This had been the court of the kings of Brycanyog from 860. And the story has it that the wife does return. Um, and the other thing as well is, is that if you look at this, this could be the story associated with the lady from the lake. Um, and all that thing about her sons, Cadogan and Griffith and Ainyan, could actually be based on something. The legend may even have, made, even have existed from earlier times. But it's very possible that some of the legends associated with Arthur are actually based on some fact rather than based on entirely fiction. So the one thing I'd like to look at finally, um, away from Langors Cranog, is this one. So I'm going to read this one out. You've been to the uh, amphitheatre of Killian, have you, um, El uh, Ellen? Gillian? Yeah, many years ago. Did you ever hear about stories associated with this being uh, the place of King Arthur's round table? No. Well, this is what the National Museum of Wales actually says about it, which it makes interesting reading. Killian's Roman Amphitheatre, the Roman Amphitheatre of Killian, has been known as the site of King Arthur's court since the 1100s. But, it, but is there any evidence to prove this was the case? Now, when I've taken people there, I've said the problem was that when 
the archaeologist Sir Mortimer Wheeler was excavating there any evidence to prove that it had any link with the King Arthur with the King Arthur legend was destroyed. But actually, I might actually be wrong on that account. In AD 1405, the French army, which had landed in Milford Avian to support um, Owen Glyndwr in his uprising against the English crown, reached Caleon in South Wales. Here they visited King Arthur's Round Table. According to a French source, um, a chronicle, um, the French visited the Round Table of the Arthurian legend. The Round Table was, in fact, the Roman amphitheatre of the legionary fortress of Isca. Now, I'd taken a group there really recently, and one of the things that struck me about the amphitheatre um, was that it's so close to the, um, the, the walls of the fort. And I, I've, I've actually looked at this and I thought, there's something not wrong. There's, there's something really wrong about the history of this amphitheatre. The amphitheatre could not have been built at the same time that the Roman amphitheatre was defended for um, the um, um, Second Augusta Legion. Because if they had built an amphitheatre just directly outside the walls, anyone attacking the fort would have just hidden in the amphitheatre. Does that make sense? Mm. So the mm. story of the amphitheatre must be that the amphitheatre was built a lot later than people tell us. This next point here, Geoffrey of Monmouth had identified Killian as the court of King Arthur in his fictional epic, The History of the Kings of Britain, in 1136. This identification, um, close to the area of his upbringing, has been described as the fruits of a lively historical imagination playing upon the physical, visible remains of an imposing Roman city. Some of the Ro Roman Isca were still standing to its original height in the 1200s, but this is 1136. And we're told by Geoffrey of Monmouth that, um, that pe little peddlers would sit on the side of the road in Killian in the 1130s, and they would sell Roman trinkets and you know, Roman coins and stuff. And he also tells us that um, the Roman amphitheatre at Killian was still vaulted and standing to its original height. Great stuff. After a thousand years, it's brilliant. So Killian soon appeared in popular Welsh and French writings by, by, the, by the writer David Ab Gwilym and Cretan Dratrius and other, others um, um, that wished to identify King Arthur's court. Arthur's Round Table, Geoffrey of Monmouth, did not actually mention Arthur's Round Table. That reference first appeared in the translations of Geoffrey's work, um, um, which were made in 1155 by a certain Wallace of Jersey. Wallace's Round Table would appear to be derived from various other fables. Whatever way you look at it, whether Geoffrey may have mentioned it or may not have mentioned it, or the translation of the work, was this was this meant was this actually the, the structure of the round table what is this about when the Carlian excavation committee was set up in 1926 the director of the national museum of wales mortimer wheeler made the most of the connection between the amphitheater and arthur's round table uh, this was likely to attract considerable funds required for a long-term program of work so was sir mortimer wheeler saying look you know we're going to dig up the, the amphitheatre, of, of which was the place of King Arthur's Round Table. But there's something that I didn't actually know until reading this. Um, we'll mention this quickly. Shameless exploitation. Wheeler announced his project to the press, and soon the Daily Mail had signed an agreement to provide 1,000 for exclusive rights and daily reports on the uncovering of King Arthur's Round Table. In the end, uh, their offer was trebled and the newspaper carried regular sensational reports. Wheeler was accused of shameless exploitation for his strategy had produced the much needed funding. So was he saying, look, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna dig up King Arthur's round yeah. table. But there is something rather interesting about what we're gonna read now, just this little bit here. Now, um, just before we do that, um, hang on, that's nothing to do with it. Um, basically, the amphitheatre was excavated within a couple of years. They, they, um, 
they set up a, a railway line in there and um, they, they had trucks and stuff and um, thousands of tons of soil went out and were used as part of a railway embankment or something like that. Um, and it was done quite rapidly. But, but there are one or two bits of intriguing information. Early medieval activity. Wheeler's excavations focus on the Roman archaeology of the amphitheatre and no early medieval remains were reported. However, a tantalizing glimpse of possible activity within the arena during the early medieval period, the time of King Arthur, is provided by one copper alloy find from the excavations, the upper part of a, a brooch pin dating from the five or six hundreds. This may have been an isolated loss, but the recent discovery of early medieval timber buildings within the Roman amphitheatre beneath the Guildhall in the City of London indicate that such sites were sometimes reoccupied at a later date. Could the Callian Amphitheatre have been reused in the early medieval period? However, no convincing evidence was ever reported and we, we are left to speculate about this pin uh, because the work was, was rushed and they wanted to get to the Roman remains as quickly as possible. We may have lost vital evidence proving or disproving whoever King Arthur was one way or another, but a lost opportunity. And on that note, it's good to end on King Arthur. So was that useful tonight, Gillian? Was it confusing or did it run okay? What was it like? It was good, but I got a bit confused at one time, I have to say. Which was the confused bit? The Maximus bit. Oh yeah, don't worry about that. You're bound to get confused. <laughs> no, with, with, the, with the Magnus Maximus bit, right. Basically, um, the Mabinogion um, has taken the story and said that Magnus Maximus went back to Britain and he found this woman and he took her back to Rome, right? Well, actually, the real story was that Magnus Maximus actually originated in Britain and marched on Rome, became emperor, was eventually killed in um, 388, and that was the end of that. But it was believed that Magnus Maximus is, is actually one of the figures that could have actually have been um, King Arthur himself. One of many figures that have been classed as King Arthur. Um, so what I'm going to do, if there's anything else, Gillian, I'm going to open the, the mics. Um, everybody, I tell you what, if anyone wants to ask a few questions, keep it specific to what we're doing and not other things. So I'm going to unmute you all. Everyone unmute. Let's, uh, Goff, is there anything you would like to say? Was, no. that, was that useful this evening? My God, I'm, he's not saying it. Oh, no, it was really very interesting. Thank you. Very good. Good. What about you, Bill? Yeah, two points, Carl. First, San Helen. I always understood from an early age that San Helen was named after St. Helena, the mother of Constantine. But looking at it, her dates were, what, third century, uh, and the so San Helen roads would be much earlier. So, so it's more likely that the roads would be named after the Welsh saint you mentioned. That's point yes. one. Okay? Yes. Yeah. The second point is, earlier you showed the statue of Owen Llawgoed on his horse with his raised sword. Yeah. And said that that was either at Dinas Rock, Craig Dinas, or it's North Wales. Right. Well, um, Dinas Rock is in um, uh, Ponty Vaughan, which is the start of the Neath Waterfalls Walk, top yes. end of the Neath Valley. Yes. I, I passed the Dinas Rock many times. It's, in fact, it's a, it's a training rock for climbers, Dinas Rock. And I can tell you now that the, uh, there's no statue there. So that statue must be in elsewhere, possibly North Wales. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll track that down for you, um, Gillian. Yeah. We'll track that down. Uh, anything, would you like to say something, Pete? No, no, not particularly, except that the, uh, the lake was actually Doze Mary Lake on Bobby Moore with the Lady of the Lake. And that's, that's the point, Pete. Um, there's lots, <laughs> yeah, there's, I know. There's lots associated with King Arthur. Yes, you know, I know. It's, it's that claim, you know? It um, is, yeah. What about you, Pam? Um, it's definitely a sort of food for thought, you know, uh, travelling through everything. Um, yes, definitely. Good. 
Um, and the last person to say anything will be Pat. And I will just uh, make an announcement myself. Go on, Pat. Oh, just to say I really enjoyed it. And it's always nice to hear about Welsh history. So thank you very much. So what I'm going to do, two things I'd like to mention before we go. <coughs> Actually, three. Um, um, it's something I, I do want to avoid, so we'll avoid it. So um, ne next week, oh, this is going to be next week, um, when my head's back out of the clouds, uh, we'll be looking at uh, Lost Monasteries of Wales. Mm. Mm. Now, that's going to be an interesting one, because um, I have just been to one of them today, um, whilst I was trying to clear my head, so whilst I make a little bit of a video. So that's going to be rather interesting. Um, so obviously we, we will be doing Saturday um, and we'll be doing the uh, class on Saturday. <coughs> evening. Um, and then also tomorrow will be as normal. Um, the, um, the, the Terry will be away tomorrow and Sue will be away tomorrow. Um, uh, but I think everybody else will be there. I do believe that Ellen is joining us. Is that right, Goff? Yes, yes, can't wait. So, um, we, every, every, everyone knows what we're doing tomorrow, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Good, good, good. What are you doing tomorrow? Um, <laughs> even, though, even though I've been teaching it, um, um, even though I've taught it through oh. this week, um, my, my, mind, my mind has gone a blank. I'm just going to have to remind myself. Um, this is really embarrassing because <laughs> I, my, my mind... You don't know what you're doing tomorrow. Are you asking us? Um, I, I am, I am going to tell you what we are doing tomorrow. Just, just um, Easter Island. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, I, I have taught Easter Island three times this week, but um, you do get certain traumas and everything erases. So uh, yes, that that'll be ready for that'll be ready for you tomorrow. And um, and anyway, anyway, thank many thanks for everybody's support. Um, tonight, anything else? Anyone want to say anything else that's relevant to what we're doing before we go? No, that was very good. Thank you. No, Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I really appreciate your support today, and I'll see you tomorrow. And, and I'll be seeing others of you on Saturday. Uh, anyway, thanks for that, Pete, Pam, Bill, Goff, Pat, and Gillian. And oh, okay. I will see you tomorrow or Saturday. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Bye, Bye. folks. Bye. 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 Goodbye. Bye. 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 No, 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 no. Sleep well, everyone. No, no. Yeah, you, Pam. So, uh, um, and um, yes, I, I'm not going to say anything, uh, but um, anyway, Gillian, um, I will see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Take care. I will. Cheers, Gillian. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.